Let's um, take a few minutes to go back around the group, about uh, three minutes each, to provide any sort of follow-up thoughts that struck you as you listen to the other panelists. Uh, I have very, very little to say. I've, I found these all dazzling uh, presentations. And what, what seems to be so interesting is that uh, the common law was not only against promoting litigation, but it was profoundly against assigning shows as an action. Uh, and the, the remedies that are provided, uh, Max's paper I th and, and Dave, David's paper is a, is a good example of this, but so, so is Michael's and to a certain extent Paul's, is that, all right, fine, uh, if you're going to have a society in which there's an enormous amount of litigation encouraged, forget about uh, the prohibition on assigning shows as an action, come up with things like ex ante claim assignments and fee shifting and, and other tools and fight fire with fire. Uh, I'm not sure I like the society that does that, but it's a fascinating set of propositions. Uh, not much to say. I, I, I agree with Max that ways of, of assigning claims could be useful. There are other ways of doing it. I've, I've long been an advocate of replacing much malpractice and product liability with, with ex ante contracts, which could accomplish the same kind of thing. But uh, so, so I, I agree with, you know, I think they're downsized to third-party financing, which some of these other schemes may not have, but uh, the, the assignment part, I think, is good. Yeah. I'll say something quickly on, on assigning claims. Um, <clears throat> I think one, it, certainly one obstacle to claim assignment is, is legal, uh, although we do see some places, such as Australia, where that may be, uh, may be going away. I do think there are some intrinsic uh, economic obstacles to, to, claim, to claim assignment, at least ex post. Uh, and that's basically the problem of adverse selection, which I think is particularly yeah. vicious in this context. So the basic you know, story, uh, the so-called market for lemons argument, which, which won a Nobel uh, Prize a few years ago, is that if you're selling your used car, uh, it's going to be hard to get a good price for your used car because people buying uh, used cars recognize that if you're selling, it's probably because you got a lemon. You, you're trying to sell a bad car, and it's re relatively hard to assess, assess the quality. Uh, as a result, people with good used cars don't sell because they don't want to sell a good used car for the lemon price. And we kind of have a, a vicious cycle uh, in which the quality of the cars sold uh, end up being very low. And, and same basic problem in litigation, but I think even more severe. Uh, some people might say, well, if you're selling your cause of action, maybe it's because you have a, a bad one. Now, sometimes there's a good reason for you to sell. That is, you're, uh, obviously, you just don't have the resources to bring the case yourself. But nonetheless, the other person is going to worry about it. And what makes, what exac it exacerbates the problem in a litigation context is that when you're selling to a third party, the third party always has to wonder not just, well, why does the plaintiff want to sell this to me? But also, why doesn't the defendant want to buy it at a better price? Because the defendant, essentially in settling a claim, in effect, is buying the plaintiff's claim from the defendant. And the defendant has a really strong reason to do so, stronger than the third party, because when the defendant successfully settles that claim, buys that claim, uh, that means no more legal fees for the, for the defendant. So I think it's sometimes very hard for these markets to, to really get moving. Even if we allow selling of causes of action, the, just the fact that there's a defendant out there who's a much more logical person to buy the claim than some third party means that many third parties will be very hesitant to ever uh, to buy them. Yeah, I, I, I agree with uh, everything that's been said. I think one thing that really strikes me is, is one's feelings about third-party financing probably vary from uh, what the claim actually is. So I would be very uh, concerned about introducing robust third-party financing in the class action system in part because I'm concerned about uh, class actions right now uh, because of the incentive problems. Shareholder litigation would be, I think, another one, although uh, and to some extent that is uh, third-party finance because the award of attorney's fees is essentially um, uh, the financing uh, mechanism there. On the other hand, if you get to something like medical malpractice where you think that, you know, we know um, through some audit studies that a lot of very good medical malpractice claims are not brought. And we also know through audit studies that a lot of very poor medical malpractice claims are in fact brought. Um, so the system seems to be broken, and it's not doing the job it's supposed to be doing. It's acting largely, I think, as a tax on the healthcare system. It's a f distorting its incentives, not, not aligning incentives. Um, and so we have to think about, uh, in that case, uh, what third-party financing uh, might do. Um, one of the barriers in medical malpractice is that if they're, if they're expert-intensive, they're incredibly expensive to bring 
right? And some of the expert intensive cases may be very valuable cases, cases that are not valuable just to the client, I'm talking about socially valuable. We want uh, hospitals uh, to prevent infections, right? And you might need a lot of uh, expert testimony about uh, the procedures done at the hospital and what the type of infection was and whether it was preventable and so on and so forth. And you may ultimately uh, not pursue it for that reason. Um, uh, or an attorney may not be willing to underwrite that. Many of these plaintiffs' uh, firms tend to be pretty small, um, and taking on a case like that where there's a lot of upfront investments may, may uh, result in a lot of uh, risk. Uh, on the other hand, if you have um, something like ex ante claim assignment, uh, it's your, to some extent, your uh, health insurer who's evaluating and has a lot of ability internally to evaluate whether or not the doctor did um, a good job, and they also might get punished at some point by the hospital. The hospital might uh, boot the insurer from their system if they think the insurer is uh, pursuing a lot of bad or opportunistic claims, right? So there's a re this repeated element between these sophisticated parties may help uh, keep some lid on the litigation. That's not going to be uh, present in every case. Um, maybe it's not even present in medical malpractice. I'm just listing some reasons why it may be. Okay. Thank you. Okay, let's uh, start with some q and I'll uh, kick things off to get us going um, and, and build on the point that Max was just making, um, which when I think, if you think about that from the perspective of an investor, um, you begin to think about uh, different claims or litigation uh, as uh, different asset classes. Uh, you may have a set of assets that's shareholder litigation, class action litigation, just form shareholder litigation. You may think about medical malpractice claims. Um, and if you think about it from the perspective of an investor, and everybody in this room probably thinks this way about their own investments, what you really think about is for any given amount of money I invest, I want the most amount of money back as fast as possible. That's what we do in real estate. When people flip real estate, you think about hedge fund strategies. You think about the myopic focus of the stock market on quarterly returns. Uh, you think about Bernie Madoff's Ponzi scheme. It's clear that almost anybody who invests money wants as much money back as fast as possible. And if that's a guiding principle for investors, uh, I think it starts to beg the question, what type of claim, what type of litigation will be invested in? Um, and I guess as I think about that, um, I get concerned that it's not the meritorious type, or at least the mer meritoriousness of the litigation or the claim won't be the primary consideration. Uh, I might be interested in things like the poor financial condition of a potential defendant. Mm -hmm. Are they uh, illiquid? Um, can I impose high discovery costs? In particular, are there likely to be high e-discovery costs? Um, how quickly could I bring a lot of bad press to bear on my claim? And in essence, what I'm doing is fronting some money in order to extract a lot of return on my investment very quickly. And so I guess I'd like some thoughts for, or some reactions from the panel on this seems like a way to sort of, once the investors get into it, meritoriousness uh, may go out the back door. Yeah, j just a very simple point to lead it off. I mean, what, what we're recognizing uh, as we talk about this is that the, the problem of uh, third-party financing of litigation is a little bit uh, like the broader financial problem of slicing and dicing mortgages and whatnot. You become so far removed uh, from what it is that you're trying to do that the systemic risk becomes greater and greater. And I think this was the reason why the common law didn't like the signing shows as an action. Uh, I think that's right. I think the other thing that may happen is what, what claims are meritorious may change. If my forecast that this would lead to changes in legal rules, then some things that are now not viewed as legally meritorious might become meritorious, but they still might not be socially useful. So. Uh, it's not only the meritoriousness, but it's also the social utility of the claim. And I, if we broaden the definition, then we might move towards claims that are not socially useful. I think that's my main disagreement with Michael, is uh, his, his basic assumption, as I understand it, is that the legal system works fairly well, and I'm not sure that that's true. And if it doesn't, isn't true, then the probability of winning turns out not to be as, as socially valuable an indicator as, uh, as, as, your, as your model would, would assume. Well, I, think, I, I don't think I, my model depends, uh, it's, a, it's a good criticism, but I don't think my model depends on uh, the legal system being especially accurate, but rather on, on an assumption that when the legal system, if the legal system hypothetically would fully adjudicate a case uh, and, and that would result in a determination, then putting aside the cost of the process, if it were theoretically possible to do that costlessly, that's at least some indication 
um, that given the fact that the legal system has reached that result, that probably better to reach that result than, than some other result. And it's not a perfect system by, by any means, but if we can reach that, those results relatively cheaply, we should. And that's why, I, you know, there is this debate in the literature on what exactly frivolousness means. And I think some people say, well, if a you know, claim has a 5% chance, it may not be frivolous. And I think sometimes we tend to think about frivolousness in a, in a very legal sense. We might say, well, is there, for example, a, a legitimate argument for, for changing existing law? Uh, and one of the things I'm trying to do in this paper is push a little bit against that and say, no, I don't, I, that, that may be perfectly valuable for the purpose, let's say, of imposing Rule 11 sanctions. But I think when we're trying to think about which lawsuits do we want to encourage, whether through third-party financing or through uh, other mechanisms, uh, we ought to say that ideally we should try to weed out those at, at kind of the bottom of the probability continuum. Sure, some of them might be socially valuable, but on average, uh, I think those are not gonna be very socially valuable. And on the other hand, if we can encourage claims that are at the top end of the probability continuum, that's more likely to be beneficial than not as well. Um. I, I guess I would say I don't, I think all those considerations are already exist whether you have third party financing or not. You're just thinking about what strategic pressures can you apply to the defendant to produce a settlement. Um, and so you have to rely a bit on whether or not you think, if you think the present system is broken, then allowing more capital into it is a bad idea. Um, and I think that's right. Um, although I do think we have to consider uh, in some cases at least what the how the mix of claims uh, might change, right? And if you think it's going to sweep in more uh, low value claims, then uh, you, you know, are adding a, a tax to the system. Maybe you, you would have to then take a step back and think, well, do we want an English rule on fees if you have private financing uh, and uh, you incorporate then some of the social costs, uh, more of the social costs get reflected in the litigation uh, that might be, uh, you might have to think of multiple uh, uh, changes uh, if we really had a robust system of financing. So. My concern is with uh, the, uh, with pro bono work and the notion that uh, it's a good thing to have lawyers do pro bono work and I don't know how that factors, how, how the warm fuzzy factor uh, enters into the calculation in talking about third party financing and what happens to pro bono work if uh, all, all cases are uh, uh, somehow shepherded through uh, using third party financing and there's no incentive for lawyers to do pro bono work and uh, everybody just goes down to the, I have this uh, vision of uh, these uh, check cashing places or payday now <laughs> or you, you just go in and, and, and uh, deposit your claim and, and get your money now and let the, the, the system deal with it. Uh, the other concern I have is uh, as judges we have a real incentive to settle cases and there's been a lot of discussion about settlement and how do third party uh, finance, financiers factor into that. For example, some of us have mandatory settlement conferences. Would we bring the third party uh, financing company in to sit with the parties and the attorneys as we uh, try to settle this case and how much say would the third party financier have in that process? Yeah. Thank you. A, a quick response to, to the last part. The, the common law doctrines <coughs> of Champerty and maintenance make it fairly clear in the states that still embrace them, and there are about at least 20 of them, I think, that if the third party financier controls the conduct of the litigation, uh, that presents a real problem. So it strikes me that bringing them into the conference room on settlement would be horrendous, uh, as I think you've instinctively figured out. I, I think it would be great. Um, <laughs> for. Uh, and, because, and, and it already and it already happens, right? It happens when you've subordinated claims through insurance contracts. Um, I don't think it'd be. I think the the, the point that both Steve and the, and the questioner were, were making, and that I'm not considering though, which is relevant, I think, is that you might change public perceptions of litigation. It's no longer me vindicating an individual right. It's now entirely a commodity. Uh, you know the word I'm trying to. Uh, yeah, what the, what the uh, sliced. We've commodified it. Is right. Yes, we've commodified 
uh, litigation. It's it's not you know it's you know every Hollywood movie would have to be changed, right? Uh, uh, it wouldn't be the underdog fighting, right? It'd be the underdog getting a loan uh, or selling the claim. I, I think that's right. I mean, there, that may, you know, I'm not trying to be um, um, dismissive. I think that actually could change people's attitudes towards what litigation does. And it sort of goes to the pro bono point, too. Um, although, I would say with, with respect to the pro bono point, if you have third party financing, you might need less pro bono work uh, because the, the claims will, will will be financed and maybe the, the least sophisticated parties who haven't had a lot of experience with the legal system would actually get some protections um, from financial inter intermediaries. Um, I think we want to go over. Yeah. And some jurisdictions, uh, are required to do it. Yeah, that's a fair point. I think we're here and then here. Max had touched upon this, I think, more than any other of the panelists, and that is the the, um, the need of the plaintiff to right a wrong. And it's an emotional need. And the idea that that can be replaced by walking into a hospital and paying uh, or an extra fee so your bills are covered or your lost wages and something for disability doesn't relieve for the, I would think, when you have a very justifiable claim in taking that plaintiff out of the system, and there is a very strong social good in a very meritorious case in correcting behavior that needs correcting. And so it seems to me that this is an interesting academic discussion, but unless um, there is some avenue um, for uh, that type of emotional gut relief from the plaintiff and the exchange of uh, some kind of uh, information that will correct behavior in the future and weed out the kinds of problems that we have in our society. I think this is a very problematic uh, system to start financing these claims in the different ways that you've suggested. I'll, I'll offer a little response to that. I think it's an excellent point, and, and there is a very interesting literature uh, called the procedural justice literature on the psychological uh, dimensions of adjudication, and, and that literature does argue that one very important thing for plaintiffs is, is to have their day in court, to feel that some people are listening to them. I think that one problem um, in assessing third-party litigation from that kind of perspective, though, is that we're very, very far from anything near any kind of ideal uh, with respect to that. Very, only a very small percentage of cases go to trial. And what I think that literature could do a better job of that, and that we need to start thinking about is how does the, the, the negotiation under the shadow of the law, how do settlement negotiations themselves potentially affect people's feelings of procedural justice or lack of procedural justice? And I'm not sure, that it's not clear to me that introducing litigation financing, introducing kind of a neutral set of players who will have incentives to kind of figure out whether you have a strong claim or not, whether that would necessarily be uh, adverse to feelings of procedural justice in a world uh, that is so heavily commodified already uh, in which so many cases settle. I think there are other things that we could do. We could make it easier, for example, for parties to apologize without worrying that things would, that that would adversely affect them in litigation. Uh, but I, I, I'm not sure that Litigation financing is going to make things much worse anyway than they already are from a kind of ideal procedural justice perspective. Yeah, I, I think that the, uh, the point of, of an, if you buy sort of insurance from the hospital to cover their medical malpractice, uh, you know, frankly, that's a deal I would take. Um, uh, but a lot of people might not. Uh, but then presumably they, they don't buy the insurance. They rely on, you know, ex post litigation. Um, and at the end of the day, I guess, we're maintaining the public courts, uh, in my view, not because some people get to vindicate their claims in court, there are so few trials anyway, but rather uh, I want to create incentives to reduce the 100,000 people killed every year by medical malpractice. Uh, and that's sort of my first order concern. And if private financing could reduce those, uh, 
in a cost-effective way, then, then I'm all for it. Um, and if I'm wrong there, then I'm against it. But uh, at present, I think there's reason to think we underclaim medical malpractice. A lot of people are actually not getting their day in court uh, because these claims aren't detected or they can't get an attorney to uh, pursue them because of the costs associated with it. Um, so it's not clear to me what way a system of private financing would cut. I think more problematically is if you really have claim assignment uh, with the plaintiff take, just retaining a small portion for whatever incentive purposes, uh, then you have commodified the claims. Maybe you're not really getting your day in court. Uh, you might change public perceptions of litigation. And I, I think those are valid concerns. Uh, other than the uh, interesting concept, I think that Mr. Presser pointed out that you could end up now in auto torts with this situation of having the courtroom with the defense side, since the insurance company pretty much controls what the attorney does there, the plaintiff side now with this third party finance controlling that, so the actual parties sitting at the litigation table really are not the parties in interest. And the jury and the judge is here dealing uh, with people who are not uh, really the parties in interest. However, one thing though I would be concerned with is the chain you're gonna begin if the third party finance goes on and you have the plaintiff who sold his or her claim and now they go and testify about pain and suffering or about future damages and the person who financed it felt they didn't um, fulfill the contract by not mentioning certain things or not being emotional enough or not being concerned enough where they could get more money for pain and suffering which is we all know something that uh, has no uh, figure on it, then you might end up with another lawsuit with a third party claimant now or a financier suing the plaintiff for not fulfilling the contract, then is he going to sell that claim to someone else who's then going to be a third party financer with a third party financer? And it could seem to me it would be a chain on the chain, which is why I feel that this is problematic. But uh, I think you just identified our panel for next year, yeah. third party <laughs> litigation derivatives. Yeah. <laughs> That might be a, uh, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a fair point, although really, you know, I think in, in many cases already you're dealing with two insurance companies, uh, not a plaintiff and a defendant. Uh, and I, I don't perceive the system as, as broken. Also, that's, I think, why you probably wouldn't see the whole claim being sold. You probably wouldn't see, see the whole residual claim residual because you want to give that incentive to the actual injured Although person. Although it does raise an interesting point with respect to medical malpractice. Right now, so many private insurance contracts, health insurance contracts have subordination, full subordination of all medical costs that basically pain and suffering operates as the incentive <laughs> right now for the plaintiff to engage in the litigation and cooperate um, because the insurance company is already, is already going to take whatever medical costs uh, and sometimes they're substantial, right? Whatever medical costs were generated um, by the malpractice, uh, and you're really relying, and that's one of the reasons why we might think carefully before we cap pain and suffering damages, um, because they're essentially being used right now as an incentive uh, for plaintiffs to come forward because so many other, uh, the claim is subordinated. Yeah, just a quick point. I think all of this underscores uh, the tremendous difficulty of generalizing about third party financing, because it might yes. be one thing if we're talking about medical malpractice, another thing if we're talking about patent trolls, yeah. and a third thing if we're talking about antitrust actions mm -hmm. or contract actions, mm -hmm. and we're just at the very beginning of thinking about yeah. this. This side and that I'm thinking about a fourth category, which would be mass torts, yeah. where there is a very widely held perception that the mere pendency of more claims incre increases the, the settlement cost, increases the value of each individual case because the ability of the defendant to defend bec becomes less conceivable in a Vioxx or a diet drug sort of situation. By allowing third party financing, don't you just exponentially increase the capacity to increase the value of claims simply by the assertion of many more such claims? Yeah. Yeah, that, that's, that's exactly, that, that, that's, that, that's, that's, that, that's my point, is that you exactly do that. Now whether that's good or bad depends on what you think about mass torts as they now exist. Well, let me, let me build on that to, to sort of make a, a, a slightly different but I think consistent point. Is there a practical way to allow third party financing of litigation but differentiate between mass torts and medical malpractice? I mean, in the real world, could we do that? Sure. Long, <laughs> long term. <laughs> I had one no and one short. Sure. <laughs> at, at least if, if one... <clears throat> We're simply doing the exercise of trying to construct legislation. We could say, well, we'll allow third-party financing up to 
uh, up to a certain amount per case. I mean, that, you know, maybe, I don't know whether that's politically viable or not, but if the political concerns are on the mass court side, I think that would make it e easier potentially for such legislation to get through. I'm not sure I would recommend that necessarily, but I, I think one could do it. I, I, I don't know, because even if you tried to do it in the, immediately, I think the, the pressures would be to change the law and to move it away from that. So ultimately, I, you might be able to do it in the short run, but in the long run, lawyers are clever guys and people, and I think they would find ways to extend it. So, so the more and, you have it, I think the more And $50,000 per settlement times three million settlements is pretty good payday, even if the value of any individual claim is pretty low. We already, already figured out a way. Uh, and, and by the way, at least as I understand it, I think it's current, uh, England doesn't permit third-party financing of tort claims. So they avoid that problem by litigation. Uh, sorry, by legislation. Are there incentives in a third-party financing environment for a defendant, for example, to uh, bypass the litigation realm and go right to the financiers and make the investors whole and attempt to solve the problem that way? I, I, well, again, that, that would suggest that the third party financier is in charge of what happens to the litigation and that runs you smack against Champerty. Uh, so the, the, typically the third party financiers um, claim, oh no, we don't control what happens. So your bypass procedure couldn't take place. So that would suggest that securitization of the third party financing uh, portion of this would be a good thing because it would remove control, make control less likely. Although to the extent that securitization the allows greater risk taking, it could rub the other way as well. Right. Thank you. I, I've got maybe a, heretic, a heretic's point of view. The problem that I, that I have is not with what you necessarily want to do or how you want to do it. It is that it's piecemeal sort of either regulation to some extent or, uh, or limited regulation in the context of a market for legal services that has significant problems with it by way of barriers to entry, by informational uh, differences that, that effectively distort the market in the first place. Uh, and so what you're coming in to do is to impose further partial regulations on a market that really in a traditional sense may not be as effective or as efficient as it should be. And so why should we do that? That's the first question. And, 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 and let me explain why I say that. Blackstone's rules at his time were developed in a market structure that was significantly different today, much less concentrated on the, the goods and services side. It's basically a one-to-one -one market where the, what you were trying to do was something totally different from today in a concentrated market. And my second goes really to Professor Abramowitz. Does your model work when, or have you looked at in your model, a lender that has a model that does not necessarily limit it to a loan by loan or financing by financing, but they effectively do an aggregate model that may change the dynamics on the risk issues? So, so. I'll, I'll take that first. If I understand the question properly, you're suggesting that some lenders may say, well, some percentage of these cases uh, are going to be valid, and if that percentage is sufficiently high, then we'll go ahead and loan to all these plaintiffs. Is that, is that, well, is that it, the concern? Well, they may, they may drop their criteria because of what I'll call an error factor, and that is that you're going to win on some, even though the probability is low, but the dollar recovery is great, and that offsets the loss side. Uh, and that that model may generate a lower probability requirement. Okay, that's a great question. I think, and I think that's what my mechanism is, is directly targeted at, uh, is the concern that, uh, and let's just take an individual case, at least for now, that in some individual case, there may be very high damages, but relatively low probability of winning. And I think one problem with the contingency fee model is that, you know, it could be a 1% case or a 3% case. If the damages are sufficiently high, you still have an incentive to bring that case to try to get a settlement. I think my mechanism, if you work through the math, would discourage that. Uh, if you think about the litigation finance company's incentives, the litigation finance company would not have incentives to lend 
uh, in a situation with a low probability and high damages because the fees are capped based on the expenses. So you can't, if you're just trying to win a lottery and you think, well, maybe there's some small chance I'm going to win the lottery. Uh, well, if you win the lottery, then the litigation finance company's fees are still going to be sufficient capped so that the plaintiff might win the lottery, but the financing company wouldn't. So, so, so in terms of a comprehensive reform, some years ago I wrote a little book on, on the optimal form of comprehensive reform, which, and no one adopted it, so now I think we have to do stuff <laughs> piecemeal. Uh, piecemeal. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, I, I agree with the first half of your question completely. Uh, the barrier to entry, information problems, uh, the, the restrictions on you know, lawyers competing for, for clients, all those things um, create a monopoly pricing system, and that creates probably too little litigation, in my view. Um, I mean, if you take a view that all, that all litigation is generally bad or that the system is broken, then obviously you don't want more of it. I, I don't quite take that view, uh, and I think that in many, t many times we don't have enough litigation or the right kind of litigation. Um, and so third-party financing may help that, actually, uh, instead of hurt it uh, a lot by aligning incentives. So. I'm not sure this falls within the ambit of uh, what you're discussing, but it occurs to me that probably the biggest third-party financer of litigation is the American taxpaying public. When you look at the federal system, for example, and combine the, the criminal and civil cases, about 50% of them are brought by individuals who incur no costs, either for the court system or for attorneys. Uh, among other things, this takes completely out of the equation uh, any uh, regulation flowing from the merits of the litigation. Uh, historically, if you didn't have a good case, nobody would take it. But what's free is overused, and so uh, you have this situation existing. In a similar vein, uh, a lot, if not most, of the fee-shifting statutes uh, will come to play in cases in which a governmental unit is involved. Uh, under the federal civil rights statute, usually individuals are sued. So when the police officer is sued for excessive force, either under his union contract or as a matter of policy, the governmental unit is going to pay for those defense costs as well as any judgments that are rendered, and of course that's the taxpayer paying for them. So I, that at least has an effect on the, the quantity and quality of litigation that's involved, uh, uh, and uh, I'm not sure if that falls within the ambit of what you're talking about as far as third-party financing is concerned. Uh, absolutely, I mean, that strikes me as a very, very profound uh, demonstration of what uh, Paul is saying, that you apply a model of third-party financing and you get uh, litigation that may have harmful social cause. Uh, I do think we sometimes find ways, uh, Paul was talking about externalities, that you, you don't take into account all the costs you impose by filing a, litig by filing a suit, I, I do think, uh, or by pursuing a suit, I do think we find we have some ways sometimes of uh, aligning things on the margins, and I think the criminal context that you bring up is an interesting one, uh, in that context, I think essentially sometimes we penalize defendants who, <clears throat> who refuse to enter into a plea bargain and then are convicted. So I, I, one might say, oh, since your lawyer is paid for, of course you're just going to kind of keep fighting all the way. Uh, not necessarily. We have a, a very complicated system, but one that does, I don't know that it's near optimal, uh, but it does give some incentives not to litigate. <clears throat> yeah, a comment on assignments. Uh, sometimes the only asset that the debtor has would be a cause of action. And as a result, the only benefit that the creditor or creditors would have would be an assignment of that particular cause of action. Uh, the problem is, if you don't get an assignment over to the creditors that have the wherewithal to be able to pursue the matter, the debtor doesn't have any money, so it's not going to be pursued. And what would be happening, you would put a judicial lien on the part of the creditors uh, on that cause of action. But again, uh, you'd have a judicial lien that's not going anywhere. Any other questions? Yes. Yeah, I have a, a question for uh, Max. It's just a, a, on a practical matter. If you set up an auction for these um, uh, 
cases. Isn't there an issue with uh, the confidentiality of the cases and, and uh, privilege and basically disclosing all the merits of the case? How do you, I mean, that, that itself yeah. is going to affect the, the pricing of it and yeah. may actually uh, negatively affect it. Yeah, I, 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 I agree. I'm a little skeptical, particularly the medical malpractice context, which is so going to be so particularized that you really could have an auction. I mean, auto accidents maybe because, you know, was he drunk? Was, you know, you might have a lot of facts that are pretty clear and, that can, and, and people can price them pretty quickly and there'll be a lot of them. Medical malpractice, the, everything's so individualized. I, I tend to agree that that, that doesn't seem practicable. Um, what does seem more practical is something like ex ante assignment, um, which, you know, then everything, because all parties are sort of behind this veil of ignorance, uh, and, you know, given your wages and so forth and your age and whatnot, your damages might, might well be known uh, should something really adverse happen. Um, but no, I, I agree, and that's why, I, I don't know what the Australian experiment has shown us, Paul, are you familiar with the, because Australia is allowing, is it, is it, is it really, a, is it really an, an auction? Um, I don't know how they worked it. I, yeah. uh, all I know is that the result was more litigation, but I don't it was know. More, there it's, was not, more, it's not an it's auction, not really except, an auction. except insofar as that's what plaintiffs might want to do. So plaintiffs yeah. have a right to sell claims. Uh, if plaintiffs want to, uh, I, I suppose, put them on eBay or the, uh, or the equivalent, they probably could. But I think more re realistically, it's they specialist. go to yeah. you know, it's much less liquid market. Much, it's markets which they'll, go, they'll go to one party that's good at valuing and makes an offer, uh, maybe to a couple of those parties. Yeah. Do, do they sell them before or after the case is filed? Do they uh, find the lawyer first or the financer first? I thought the financer matched them to the attorney, but that, that, that could be. I, I actually thought it was the other way around. I thought it was the other way around. I think that the attorneys it's often refer people to finance. Certainly in the United States, attorneys often refer people to financers. So. Right. If we go the other way, you'd bid up the price of advertising price. in the back of phone books. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, great. Well, thank you very much. Really appreciate it.